I got laid off. I got fired. I got fired. But here's the thing. I was a binge guy. I remember seeing her at the local titty bar. I feel dirty right now just telling it into a microphone. We're broken around here. Working man sucks. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Working Class Holes Podcast. I'm your host, Ed McGowan, here in the break room with my co-host. What's up, buddy? What's up, Eddie? Josh uh, Ricardo. I am very excited. <laughs> For a lot of reasons today. First of all, uh, our guest is a really funny comedian. Uh, he's been on Fallon. He's done a ton of stuff. Also, he's the first guest we've ever had that we were up for the same role in a TV show, and he got it. Whoa. And I cannot wait to talk to him about this. <laughs> Without any further ado, Matthew Bassard. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, right. uh, rejected comic number two, <laughs> I'm supposing, based on that. No, actually, all right. Uh, <laughs> Just we'll start this way yeah. for today. Okay. Uh, it was a role on Marvel's Mrs. Maisel. Yeah. And I it was the so I love the show. I you know Give me soup. Big great fan. show. And I got in there and they called me back for that role three times. Whoa. And they were like, it's between you and one other person. Wow. And I didn't know they don't tell you who it is, obviously. But what I loved about the role is that they actually break a bit down in it that I thought was really fun because it's like a real it's dialogue. right. It's really good dialogue. So it was like I don't remember the exact uh, words, but it was basically like you know. I like, do. You, I know you do. <laughs> I blocked it out. I had That's to do it lines. so many times. <laughs> I knew his lines. I knew my lines. Yeah. yeah, it was just like a wonderful. I'll let you do it, but it was just like a wonderful way of constructing bits, and it took place okay. in my favorite part of the show that was so accurate to stand up for me it was like the stand up diner. Yeah. You know. Uh, so go ahead, do the line. It was a uh, joke work. It, it, cameras swinging around the diner, pulling past two comics even together as, as it makes its way towards uh, you know, Midge. But it just catches five lines of dialogue uh, with me, comedian number two, I think, and then the comedian number one of uh, uh, joke works great in Boston, Philly. I get to Denver, nothing. Yeah. The guy says, it's a regional joke. My sandwich joke, I have a different sandwich for every city. <laughs> I it's say, which sandwich is funniest? He goes, Hoagie. I go, Hoagie is a funny sandwich. <laughs> yeah, it's the best. It's such an accurate. I think I, I'm guessing Noah Garden Schwartz had some. Yeah, you know, as a writer for that show, and and adds a lot of authenticity to the stand up yeah. and the talk about stand up. And like, I read that and I was like, I bet Noah had some part. It was of the most yeah, accurate because so cool. I I read so for that's great. Four and the smugness of it. Oh, it's Hoagie. great. It's great. Just so oh, proud. So great. I love it. The, the sound in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Hoagie. He's like, I got a I got a different Hoagie. I got a different sandwich for every city. Because <laughs> it's true. Because gyro. <laughs> I because I road. do the road so much. I mean, the clubs here like sporadically all work, but the road is where I do all my work. And it is true, I don't change anything on the road that much. But you know the gigs we play. It's yeah. like you're in the middle of a red country, a red. I call it the red country. But like you really are in deep with people that are not the demographic of say the comedy seller. And you're like that is true. Sometimes you have to change something demographically. Grocery stores. I have to change. I have a yeah. grocery store joke. I have to change it. I, I love saying Dwayne Reed, but I can't outside of New York. Right. Yeah. I say uh, 7-Eleven here when I'm down in Philly. I say Wawa. I'm going uh, to Boston this week, and I'm going to say Duncan. <laughs> Wawa's a funny store. Yeah. Wawa's great. But yeah. see, it's a, like Wawa, the syllables. You, don't, you start to lose it, though. Oh, oh if you're in uh, Texas, you can do Bucky's. Bucky's. See, Bucky's is fun. That's and a great that syllable. Would, you, just, just, just that. People get it, will cheer just for hearing Buc Buc Oh, yeah. Uh, I know that. I yeah. <laughs> I once saved a set by just saying who likes Wawa and who likes... Uh, what's the other fucking competition? It's Wawa and well, there's there one just, other. Oh, Sheets is like... Sheets, sheets yeah. is like the oh, I was yeah. in a Western Sheets Texas. area, and yeah. I was... It was like the first five minutes. They were super tight, and I somehow pulled that out. And like the whole sec, I coasted. I was in a Sheets late night, and I'm just like trying to get dinner in a Sheets. Yeah, and I go, uh, And the guy goes, yeah, they make sandwiches back there. I go, like a Wawa? And he looked at me like we had to stare down for a moment. He goes, you know where you are, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's start for real now. Okay. Matthew, what is your craziest or worst day job while pursuing your craft? Uh, not craziest, but worst. I was a financial analyst, and that was Ooh. that was yeah, the really toughest job for I had. You. And I hate saying that, but yeah. you look like a guy that knows about finance. Wasn't what you think it was. That sounds so fancy. It was a nine to five, and I mean, really loose yeah. on the nine and really loose on the <laughs> yeah. five. It was a nine forty five to four forty five. If, oh, if no. no one was around to yeah. check. Oh, especially finance. Yeah, oh, yeah, you man. could figure it out. Two person company. I was the third employee. It was it was the main guy, and all of this is not true, by the way. This is all made up. <laughs> I'm, I'm changing all the details because I can't tell the truth, but I'm going to say it was a main woman and the, a male secretary. Whoa. Um, and uh, my boss. I've been a male secretary. Yeah, so, and I came in as an analyst, but um, so kind of in between, and I was more just a spreadsheet jockey and yeah. made a, enough money, uh, like a teacher salary, more or less. Yeah. And um, uh, 
it was I started comedy like probably a month after I started that job and like I no no skin in the game no heart mm-hmm. oh just, yeah. once just you found comedy yeah, yeah. It was yeah. just what's the minimum I can do yeah, 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 yeah. not trying to get ahead get to the next uh, spot to, like, get what? certified as an analyst <laughs> take all these tests my, yeah, I, I, but you're very good in math though correct I like math because yeah. 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 finance wasn't your, math your tweets it wasn't math huh? it wasn't math boy well, it's a lot of Excel everyone... spreadsheet because I work around in finance I know about that that kind of job it's so much Excel. It, you're like you. It's exactly what he was saying. They don't ask you to really do any creative abilities with numbers. Like it's you don't use like, any kind of calculus or anything like that. No, I God, you no. Like post some kind of. St- you, you have like a very. Uh, I, I learned more math than I would have ever, ever needed. It's like so <laughs> indulgent how much math I learned. It's I would be so. People talk, oh, calculus. When will I use this? I'm like, if you're lucky. You know, you know how hard you have to fight to yeah. have a job where you use calculus? Yeah. Yeah. You would be so blessed. Yes. Yeah. What a dream to get to use fun math. You probably make math. a million minimum if you use calculus in your job. Or very little and you're working in academia. Oh. Either making 20000 or yeah, a million. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or you're, tweet- you're, or you're an right? educator, yeah. maybe. Yeah. My brother builds engine casings for I'm fascinated uh, the that. government and for private, all this oh, stuff, wow. all these plants. Uh, and he's like, I don't use calculus. I barely know calculus. It's just a ton of trigonometry. I'm like, so you're using 10th grade math. He's yeah. Like, yes. That's crazy that, that we spent so much time teaching kids math when they should have been teaching them how to balance a checkbook. I like still think it's great to learn math. I think an abundance of math is great because it increases your just ability to understand Well, things. I like that it never changes. It's, oh, the answer is the answer. Yes, yes. I did use VLOOKUP. I remember using VLOOKUP on Excel. What is that? So you can, if you have just a big array of things, if you have a stock, like a, a stock, uh, this account and then this number next to it, just a big long list, it basically says every time you see this, add those up. And create a table based on how many oh, times man. you see this. So it's a great thing for, yeah. and it felt truly satisfying. Like, look at me using my degree, using <laughs> right, this right, right, right. very standard, non-exotic Excel uh, thing. And then, I mean, just just the nature of the job was so. People can be averse to technology sometimes. What a life handsome men leave, Eddie. Because this guy uses a little bit of math, makes some good money. You're over there scraping plates in the back of a Philly <laughs> Chinese restaurant. How the other half lives, huh, Ed? Hey, uh, I, 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 <laughs> that's his worst job. Yeah, is like I hated the fact that I had to be sitting here. I hated, the, <laughs> but I, hated I know trigonometry oh, too. Okay. Here's the thing: I know trigonometry. Yeah, yeah you're an engineer. That's just, a, dude, that would make me. I know me. trigonometry. I'm still working in dishwasher as a dishwasher. You're an engineer. I went to engineering school for four years. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what kind of engineering? Electrical. Nice, the best Then one. he found his true love. And then I failed out. Crack cocaine. Uh, I, I failed that's out. a hard degree. It's a very hard. You like is like the most math of all of them. Electro, yeah, yeah. It's all, it, that's where I really got lost is all the like the quantum and the and, the and the imaginary numbers, all the differential uh, equation oh, stuff, all that. Hard, yeah. yeah, differential was so fucking hard. I uh, plus I was doing like a lot of LSD at the time. Like I was just, uh, I was not didn't help. There yeah, for the, couple of yeah, couple of hiccups in the old career. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember sitting. I remember sitting there in the final. Like this, I need to get an A plus on this to stay in school after eight semesters, and I was like. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going. I'm going home. <laughs> this yeah. is done. This I is once done. for an SAT. I really needed it to try to get a scholarship for football, and I held in a deuce for the whole thing, and it really affected my score. Really, like it was all on the line. But I had such a fear of using a public restroom. Oh, uh, I don't have that anymore because of travel. Now I'll I'll shit in a hole in the wall. Yeah, I don't care yeah, anymore. Yeah, right. But during that time, as like an eight, seventeen year old, I was like, all right, I'm. Yeah, I'm oh, just gonna wow. hold it, huh? That and it's like a four and a half hour test. It's long. Well, it's yeah. very distracting it, it, to have to take a oh, shit. Oh, yeah, yeah, are you kidding me? It's having the worst. a pee is great though. Sometimes if you hold in a pee, you're so much more productive. More focus. Yeah, yeah. more focus. I agree. Yeah, yeah. I used to, it's when not, weird. When I played sports, if I had to take a piss, like I was playing hockey, yeah, I would have great shifts. Like it wouldn't. I don't know if I would make it to the third period, but like that first two periods were great. Yeah, you're killing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not with the not with the deuce on no, deck. No, Can't very distracting. Deuce on deck. So how'd you get the job with the uh, the two other people? Uh, how'd Swimming. you get this job? I met a guy at the JCC. Oh, oh, you swim as well. My yeah. Oh my God, were yeah. you a college athlete as well? No, no, no. Just swim uh, like high just, school and a club team in college, or specifically masters team in college. I started at the end of high school. I really loved it, but I wasn't good enough to go yeah. to college to do it. So I started swimming with the masters team and the club team. Uh, trained wherever I could in college. Just wanted to do it. Didn't care yeah. about competing. Just really liked it. You just feel really the same way the about stand up? Yes. So you love stand up the same way? Yes. Similar. See, that's interesting. So those are two, yeah, two things I love. I, I love was a runner to, as a kid, but. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. So I love talking to people that had another love mm-hmm. or a first love before they discovered stand up. 
and understanding like okay is that did that love transfer over in the same way because stand up so because i love sports for the um the meritocracy that's attached to it it's like yeah. you're not most of the time 99 percent of the time you're gonna play if you're good mm -hmm. they don't want to lose so they want you to play uh, so I always found that kind of conflicting for the I had the love I had for it. You never found that at all with like the competition levels being skewed in entertainment. Like it's not really based on stand up. Feels from the most meritocratic of any of the entertainments I can think about compared to singing, oh, oh, compared oh, oh, to oh. music, compared yeah, yeah, to yes, yes, acting. Yes. I, that that was the thing I loved about comedy because I was in a less competitive scene. Was there was just a night where I realized. What if I treated this like swimming? Swimming, I'm yeah. just trying to be in the pool as much as I can and do the work. It doesn't matter what you do day in, day out. That's true love. Yeah. Uh, just just put in the reps, put in the time, and you will see the results. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, with swimming, I stopped seeing the results because I was training hard and not smart and really plateaued to a place where I, sh I should have been much faster. Yeah. And I was very frustrated with that. And I didn't start out very talented. And then when I started comedy, I noticed that I had a little bit of something from the start. Yeah. Not like killing right out of the game, but I was like, I have a little something. There's just something that mm -hmm. seems to be... But there's some built-in aptitude be, here, right? Yes. Yeah. And I seem to be doing much better than other people who started, uh, though I'm still abysmal next to a real you know, sure. pro. And I was like, yeah. what if I applied... What if I actually tried hard at something I'm good at? Versus, I spent I wasted eight years on something I'm bad at <laughs> that uh, I just love. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, imagine, right, imagine right, if right. I actually honed uh, an inherent skill. That's pretty insightful. When did you? Where did you start? Houston. Okay. But despite its size, but it was at that point really not a competitive place for comedy. Yeah. There was one D room, like cruise ship comics, no credits, thousand yeah. dollars for the headliner, no feature. They're just guest spots, and I love that room because they put me up a bunch because no one else was coming to hang out. I was yeah. just the one guy who was there every weekend. That's great. And then the other room was the Houston Improv, which seats four sixty, which means it was a black room. Yep. The only people who could fill that room were Bruce, Bruce, and yep. Earthquake, and Cheryl Underwood, oh, and Gary Owens. That was yeah. it. So. I would come there for like the weekdays, but it was, I was not often a fit for the headliners. Sure. And those are my two rooms. That was the, yeah, because I started in San Diego where La Jolla Comedy Store was my home club, but it was yet to boom like it is now. I mean, mm, San Diego yeah. now is like 17 rooms you can get up in. But so many. when I started there, it was probably three total um, and only one real club. Uh, but I, there was one club that was an all black club, but that was like the only place that would put you up mm -hmm. if, you know, but you had to be able to handle an all black room. And it was very much BET era. They, they tried to copy Comic View. They put a table up on the stage. Oh, uh -huh. They yeah. had people sitting up there that were not like attractive. Like, you know, like <laughs> Comic View would have like attractive black people oh, up yeah. there. It would be like people heckling you. Like, <laughs> throw, one guy got shit thrown at him. One guy got <laughs> stabbed in the parking lot. Like, it was not a fun. Oh, but learning how to perform there was really oh. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm kind of, uh, you know, I talk about it in my act. I'm Hawaiian Sicilian, so everyone's brown but me. So I wasn't necessarily off marker with being around mm -hmm. a room of, of black people it was just it was fucking warfare <laughs> i mean did you get Why up did he stab a guy uh so i like to think it was like a really good comedy note well it was just like <laughs> gotta be more present up there the comic was uh Don't talking just say to the, the words. guy the guy's girl <laughs> yeah too many syllables <laughs> Words, Terrible brother. setup, bad punch. Like, that would be legit. I'd be for that. <laughs> He's just stabbing people who are lazy, <laughs> where hacks get stabbed. <laughs> it was called Mr. O's, where the hacks get stabbed. <laughs> And the guy came back after he was stabbed. He came back. That's how hard it was to get mic time. The guy came back after, was, yeah, after the stab wound oh healed. God. That's how hard it was to get. Because the comedy store back in the day would not... If you were like a urban comedian, the bookers there at the time were not yeah. trying to put you up. It just right, wasn't gonna happen. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying they were racist, but it wasn't. Fi it's La Jolla, so it's just like any demographical situation. There were yeah. so that was the <laughs> separate but equal. <laughs> you heard it here, separate, folks. But equal. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I was like the only white guy performing at the place. So it was like I was living the reverse life of all my counterparts on that show. They were like, hey, how can we play the comedy store? I'm like, I don't know. They're not putting me up. You're, you, you're the only one's putting me up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but did you do that room in Houston ever? Like when it was packed? No, uh, maybe like once or twice, but ne never really. The other room I did was really blue collar, which was great for me uh, to like perform yeah. to that kind of crowd, given my background's not that. Um, and. I kind of built my act for them. And then when I, I spent a summer in Austin before I moved to California. And boy, does that blue collar comedy not translate to the kids at the comic book shop, mm, no. the cafes, no. you know, yeah, yeah, alt yeah. shows. I mean, they're so more like having both those, you know, the sides of it. Alt was pretty huge then too, right? I'm Very assuming. Big. I'm just trying to do the math in my 20, head. Because like thirteen, yeah, like yeah. Dimitri oh, Martin right. was oh, right. massive. Yeah, yeah. Hannibal, uh, Mulaney, yeah. Kinane, yeah. everyone was doing Kinane at that point. 
Um, yeah, but I feel then I like had Alt just took over now and is just uh, mainstream stand up. Well, a then way, now the blowback way. to that was. I mean, I have lots of thoughts on this. Yeah. Oh, please. The saw. I, I call it the the beta the beta crew where comedy got like really soft and and sweet. Yes. You saw the Chicago crew of Mulaney, Pete Holmes, Kinane, Kumail. Um, that that whole crew was so popular among comedians, and then now mainstream popular. And I would say the reversal was it, it now. Now, for people who are just starting watching comedy, they've never seen the the broy machismo of people mm-hmm. like Schultz and Gillis. Yeah. So that's that's a that's kind of the oh, what about yeah. this? Not this like you know pretentious, artsy soft boy shit. What yep. about this kind of real dude? And I think it just waffles back and forth over over yeah. like five to ten year kind yeah. of intervals. That's that a really sense. that's a really accurate yep. trail. I mean, I think honestly, the part about stand up that I loved. And I, we talk about it on the show all the time. It's just kind of the harshness because if you come from a harsh background, mm-hmm. that's why it kind of attracted a lot of people that do right. come from like not great backgrounds. I mean, obviously that's not your situation, but the harshness does come from a certain place where I used to go, "Oh, I really love like how ruthless that is," because it's able to also be funny. Uh, but yeah, there's it's hard to find that mix. I think you're right. Every five or ten years, it comes back to play. Yeah. I remember uh, when I discovered those like the you know Mulaney and <laughs> stuff. I was like, "Look at me, another like non-confrontational." <laughs> like soy boy you know raised coddled like i found it very relatable and i was like oh this kind of makes comedy feel more accessible to me yes. that you don't have to be i thought you had to be jim norton you i thought you had to be like a piece of shit uh-huh. who, i don't want to eat salads uh yeah, you know yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a piece uh-huh. of shit i have no that's impulse that's control. interesting it's attracted so, a whole wave of comedians mm, into stand-up that ugh, normally wouldn't be ugh, and now i've there. <laughs> now i've seen this whole wave over the last 10 years of like now that's the norm and they're pretending like what i'm doing now is so normal for comedy and people pretending like it's somehow a i grew up in a cul-de-sac i'm not a comic i'm like we all grew up in cul-de-sacs <laughs> yeah. now look at don't tell all of us yeah. had good education we weeded the other we guys out College. There's nothing interesting about this. this. Is not subversive in the slightest. It's so boring. We weeded the interesting I am so disgusted to be part of this wave. Out. <laughs> now I just want dirt bags. I want Tim McLaughlin. I can watch Tim McLaughlin all day. I'm a big fan of Tim right now. Oh my god, yeah. it's so refreshing. Yeah, yeah. I have a gambling problem. That's amazing. I cheat on my taxes. He's great. I love broken. You're right. Broken people are so fun. It's so nice to have around Uh, until you have like money laying around and they steal it. Uh, So many people now being a financial analyst, that's not that interesting of a background. Like having come from that. And then I had other jobs, but that one was the worst just because it was such a small company that my whole self esteem was just my boss's mood that day uh, right and my boss's mood that day was just the stock market that day yeah. or how one of his clients had nothing treated him that you, day nothing to do with your work uh-huh and and i i was bad but like i was trying to you know that feel, kind of being in a bad relationship you're like is this am i making mistakes am i facing this attack yeah. because i'm making these mistakes or is it just how they feel yeah and that kind of that, that it's crazy dissonance, when you, when not knowing if it's like you that, or them yeah. yeah and you take on their Mm-hmm. personality like you're just you just want to please mm-hmm. kind of got that like young like well, I've always yeah. been in you know because I've always had to work in offices I'm not a manual labor guy I'm all my family manual labor I knew I couldn't do it so I did offices plus the schedule for me works out with stand-up I could nine to five I could kill it nine to five take one power nap and be able to do shows and I was like all right if I can make money this way and not have to sleep on a couch I'll do it but it's I'm always in subservient roles I mean for a long time until recently but it's like you go in and you are are like for me as a male secretary or some at like admin contractor guy just trying to make money to pay his rent Mm -hmm. you were treated like shit oh yeah yeah and you're right you are basing everything you're doing off of the happiness level of your superiors totally and they take they don't especially people who are like middle management like it sounds like you have like a boss who is rich i have like He's middle very successful, very yeah like middle job. management people making not that much more than me just coming in their pants every time they get to tell me what to do like just <laughs> the love the power mm-hmm. just drunk off this little power they have or monitor uh, yeah. oh yeah. my and I, I fall underneath them so it that that was has been the worst <laughs> it's any job where it's like Dude, you make five dollars more than me. Like, why are you <laughs> kicking me around? Like you're Gordon have, Gecko. Have you ever been in a position now where you have power over someone and you felt yourself getting like just high in, off that? Just in bed. No, <laughs> no, actually, I I really enjoy like the, I enjoy in my like professional life. Be like even stand up is one thing when you're on stage, but I do enjoy like the under the radar 
scenario of being in an office. So I'm not, even if someone's, I think because I've been always the report in person, when I have employees, I'm like a pretty effective, assertive, but at the same time, not really like drunk mm-hmm. off of telling this fucker, you better put the pencils this way. Like I, I never. You can't be too nice. That's the thing If like you dream about being so nice, but then you're like, you gotta lay it down a little bit. You I'm gotta, not that. You gotta beat up someone. Oh yeah. I yeah. have like assistant editors I deal with sometimes where um, I'm like, dude, I'm showing you this so that you can do my job. Mm-hmm. Like in five years, you can have, you can yep. be doing this. So let me just show you this. And like, I'm, I'm gonna be curt a little bit, but like I'm looking out for you, and I'll look out for you. All yeah, the, you know but that's I mean? our upbringing, As right? As like middle, like lower yeah, middle like class. I want to bring, I want to bring you up. I'm a union. I'm raised by union f- guys. But if you fuck me, uh, oh yeah, it's like I'm gonna be dude. loyal to the craft. But if you dude. fuck me, oh, it's uh, man. Yeah, there's if so you many. Fuck me because like, if you fuck me, just an honest mistake, it's fine. But if you fuck me, just because like, dude, we talked about this. <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, I get like, I can't do this with this kid. <laughs> I got going for you. You were on Fallon, right? Yes. Have you ever done like a TV appearance like that, and then the next morning had to show up to any kind of day job? Yes. Um, I love those stories because it's like you see the top of the mountain. But it sounds like you're a pretty pragmatic person, and you came about comedy in a way that was pretty pure. It didn't seem like you had delusions of grandeur in your head. So maybe this isn't for you. But I feel like for me, especially years ago, if I would have got like a, a big TV credit and had to show up at the day job, it would have been like. I loved it. I thought it was so cool. Yeah, I found I that figured. so fun. I still was working at that finance job um, and I booked Comedy Central and I took vacation Hell days. Yeah. I took a Friday and a Monday off so I could go out there and film it. And um, I loved it. I talked about. Uh, in that set, I talked about having currently that job. <laughs> I didn't call myself a comedian because I wasn't. I had business cards that had a picture of me doing comedy. It said Matthew Broussard, financial analyst, and I give them out after shows. I, do you have any more of those? I would love to put I that have on a the picture pin board. somewhere. That's no, awesome. my mom has it. My mom. I, I saw the card this weekend because I forgot about it. My mom kept the card. That's oh, um, I love that. And it's my goal was to keep that job as long as possible. I hated the notion of being financially dependent on a comedy. I love doing comedy as long as I got to do it in front of good crowds. Yeah. It didn't matter where I made my money. I would like to make the leap and I would like for my job to know my job to not hold me back. But I, 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 my goal was to hold on to that job until they fired me until I had to quit. <laughs> Boy, was that a lot sooner than I planned. Um, but yeah, really I, I showed back up and I, loved, I I came back to the office like, how cool is that? I'm going to be on TV and I have this job. Like, that's just so neat to me to live yeah. to live these two lives. It felt so rebellious uh-huh. because I was raised. I had a, a, a good education, upper middle class family. I had my life laid out for me from a very young age. My parents says you have a small. Here are your skills. Here are what we have trained you at. You have a small number of employment options that I was breaking away from that at all and having some success was to me like I was James Dean. Oh, I you're was, the craziest I was motherfucker in the so neighborhood. So punk rock. Oh yeah. Yeah. What did your parents I mean now it's working out for you, but what did they say when you decided to do it? My mom still hates it and would love if I quit. I can't call her if I'm like feeling bad about things. She was like, Yeah, that sounds bad. You should you should quit. Yeah. You know? Oh wow. And then my dad uh, passed away twenty sixteen, but he was like f- finally getting on board with it. He was like yeah. he was I think he saw me on some T V show and he was like, That's cool. Yeah. I was like, oh, I was my son up there That's super doing the cool. real thing. Yeah. So what happened when you went back to the job after doing that set? Did you um, did anyone say, oh, hey, what, what, what would you do this weekend? And you I was tell fired them? by the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I did. And people didn't really. In Houston, the. No one knows I, about no anything. No one really understood. They're like, that sounds like a big deal. You're on Comedy Central. And yeah. I was like, yeah, no. They're like, it's and a I lifelong think dream. Mind, maybe I was projecting it into, Yeah, it was like, I remember the day I got the email saying I got it. I was like checking out at Whole Foods. Like, how are you doing? I'm like, it's the best day of my life. I mean, it's a <laughs> lifelong dream. I just got dream. Comedy Central. This yeah. is the best. This is the single best day of my life. It's being uh, drafted in the NFL, like, essentially. Cool. They probably thought I was just like a fuck. <laughs> crazy person. <laughs> Uh huh. You and a tie. Uh huh. Because the uh-huh. normal, like the average yeah, person knows pizza what pizza for ten dollars. Because Thursday on pe- on Thursdays pizzas are ten dollars. <laughs> that guy's on VH1 too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this guy over here working behind me he had a whole arc on Law and Order. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> when you get that, you're like, dude, this should be changing my life. Yeah. I remember thinking. I mean, obviously there. I feel like now there's so much information on people getting famous that you can figure out like, oh, these are kind of the trends and I have no control over it. No, oh, guess what? It's like a viral thing or someone helped them. But back in like 2010, 2012, 2013, if I were to, like, if you get this, you're fucking headlining. 
it's over, dude. You got a fucking TV credit. You're doing the big shit. And it's not that. That's why I always love when you show up to the job. Yeah. And I love that you were happy about it. Changed nothing. And also, I, I thought I thought it was going to change my life. I don't know anyone saw it. I think I got like seven people messaging me online. And no one remembers me from it. You can't even find the video anymore. It, it, it didn't change. It, it did open doors. And... Of There's course. that huge mythology of this it. one thing made you famous of like, no, it's, no, it's, it's, a little it's usually thing, a lot a little of little thing. things. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and there's that thing when people recognize me now, where they're like, I think I've seen you in something. I'm like, you've actually probably seen me three times. Sure. The first time you forgot, second time I felt familiar, and third time it finally latched. Ah. And I think that's what it really takes of like, even Mulaney, who I love, I've never quoted him in this, of like, I lost his stand-up and then I realized later, oh, I had seen his Weekend Update segments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think I saw two oh, or three of his clips yeah, and I right. finally looked down at his name. You have to, you like, the, the real way to stick is by just showing, putting your fucking face yeah. in front of them. Yeah, it's working consistently. Until they can't forget you. Yeah, yeah. a it's lot of little things. working consistently. It adds up. Like, there's there's very few people who we see one clip and go, I'm a fan. We see one and then we see another and we see another. They're like, okay, they win. What do you think the average person, how many comics do you think they know that are actual stand-ups? Not, the, not SNL, nothing else, just stand-ups. Got Two it. to three, maybe. Wait, your average person. If you walked up to someone, uh, I mean, this is New York City, so this might be a rigged deck. Know? How many? Uh, but if you were in some random town, and you're like, uh, like Phoenix, Arizona, and you walked up to somebody and you said, "Hey, how many comics do you know that are actual?" And how many do you think they would know? One or two, three? My mom has seen all of Nate Bargatze's uh, specials. Oh wow! And still doesn't know his name. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. What do you think? Five to ten. And who do you think's like the one that shows up on every list? It's probably someone famous, like Eddie Murphy or something. Or not even I that. I think he ages out for people in their twenties. My mom knows who, or my dad knows who Shane Gillis is now. Yeah. Well, that's you're a comedian still, though. He doesn't. But there's still some association. There has to be. And he's my, a Philly guy. My mom watches a lot of stand up, and then she'll of call you? me. Yeah, and she'll call me and she tell me who she's. The last two people she watched, and this is so bonkers to me, were Marcella Arguello. And uh, Alice Wetterland, wow. and she hasn't watched Shane Gillis yet. And I, I mean, no disrespect to those comics, but sure. it's so interesting that she finds these, I would say, less accessible uh, hours of comedy. She just kind of opens up whatever pops up in her face, and it's mm -hmm. it's kind of random what's recommended to I'll her. I'll send her my stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> less accessible. And like those are both me. HBO specials. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, she'll kind of just open and, and all like pretty willing. And there's there's another one where I won't say the name, but I'm like, oh, you watch that one? That's, that's not good. <laughs> I mean, you have, not really even a stand up. You keep you telling me to quit special. and you're watching this shit, mom. Yeah. <laughs> My therapist will always tell me what stand ups he's watched recently. He was like, oh, I saw this clip, this person. What do you think of them? I like this one or I didn't like this one. And he'll find some you know pretty notable people. He'll be like, talking about like, uh, what's his name? Marcelo mm -hmm. from SNL. Uh -huh. uh, and, and you know some of the bigger names, and you know Jesse Kirsten. And then for a couple of weeks, we had this mystery game going where he was like, this one guy keeps showing up. I really like him. Clean cut guy, wears a suit. And I'm like, Kellen Erskine? He goes, maybe. I go, kind of losing his hair? He goes, no, no, he had dark hair. And after like three or four weeks, he was like, oh, I think I forgot a name. It's John Maroney. I'm like, you didn't know who John Mulaney was this whole time? I mean, like, that, like he's like pop ago. culture now. I mean, with wow. he's pop culture. He's a punchline. Yeah. I can yeah. say Mulaney in my act and people would know who he is. 80% yeah. of people catching the reference. That's wild. It's crazy. That he would know the that. order in which people learn who people are is pretty odd. Yeah. I My therapist is a, is a only, I mean, not only, but he sees, he's like really famous in comedians. So I, we, I'll never ask him about who he's watching. Because oh, yeah, he probably yeah. sees them, and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to yeah. know no, yeah. all yeah, your more yeah. successful clients than me. I'm already fucked up coming in here. I don't want to <laughs> deal with all this extra insecurity. I'm already bringing a whole bunch in with me. What? Um. All right. Working the road now, especially now that you're engaged. Mm -hmm. I know you've been engaged, but you, I know you have like a whatever. You have you have a partner, a serious partner. Yeah. And I have a two year old now. And I'm noticing differences in just in the reality of like how I approach the road and why I'm there and like what's important. Has that changed for you at all now that you're looking to be a family man and married and all those things and yeah. life being more traditional in a small sense? Yeah, I would really like a more traditional life. It, the, the, you leave a day job where you, you, you move from day job to comedy uh, and then you spend the next however many years of your life praying for once again that kind of regularity yeah i would dream of a thing i could just wake up and go to and make money that day and then leave at the end of the day 
whether it was writing or acting, I would kill for that. I have so much free time and so lack, so much of a lack of a schedule, and I miss it so much, and it's so weird. I left that. Yeah, I, that was it's not wild. a bad gig. I was like, why was yeah. I? Why did I hate that? Why did I want to get out of that so much? I guess I kind of said I didn't, but that feeling of like, oh, I would love some stability and just yeah. doing comedy on my terms because yeah. now it's. Well, now I, I'm well, scared. So I don't know how to do it long term. I don't know how we'll do it because Laura does comedy too, and we 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 don't know. We know someone will have to give up something, and it's going to be ugly. Yeah. And our goal is to just work really hard and make a lot of money so we can have freedom when that time comes, and we have yeah. to make those tough calls of who quits what. Um, do you guys tour together? A little bit. Yeah. That makes I mean, it, she that, has enough comedy of her own that she does. Yeah. That's yeah. gonna make it easier, though. She'd rather be here doing comedy in town, you know. To, to actually, I, I love, I love uh, that answer because yeah. uh, that's kind of where I was going with, with, you know, the question is that the for me now, like I was at home all weekend, I couldn't take any gigs because I just had my son, and it hit me that I was like, man, I'm glad I, I was able to do that, and I remember being so ashamed of having to make money in other ways. And then even when I started Hilarious. making, you know, I was so ashamed of it. I didn't want to yeah. tell anyone because it made me feel like I wasn't, even though I was doing professional work and I was making a living at stand up, like I could have quit. Like now I could quit all the other ways I make money mm -hmm. and I'd probably pull down 35, 40,000 at stand up, which technically is making it. Yeah. Yeah. But that, no, there's no way I could have a wife in New York <laughs> there's yeah. no way I could have a son I mean even in any other town yeah. 40 grand isn't that much no. I mean maybe you know some like Michigan in some place but still you're not living no like you're not going on you're not taking your family on a vacay or able to do fun stuff like it's just it's really weird now how I look at stand-up and touring differently and all that and and why I look at it differently and it's funny that you're saying stability now. It's like yeah. one because now you have to take any gig. Yeah. Well, not any gig, but you know. Uh, it, yeah, I, money is the uh, primary motivator. And they, I read a study: all you really need to be happy 70, is like 000. sixty six hundred thousand dollars a year. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you made a step on your punchline. That's fucking funny. That's I it. I got all serious. Beyond like, that, how much were they saying? Because I, I bet I make more than that. And I'm pretty miserable. Beyond that, what are time. you even doing? Just spinning your wheels. <laughs> Seriously, um, it is six hundred thousand. Right? It might be. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it really is six hundred thousand. There's, an, I've been oh looking this up. I, I, am, that is more accurate than the seventy five thousand they that's do insane. say. Oh fuck that number. That's poverty in New York. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's I, I, I spent my whole life chasing six figures because that was what my dad made. He was like, this, I'll say it. This is weird say transparency. It. My dad made about a hundred. Me growing up in the nineties, he was he did a lot of money. A chemist. Yeah. It was a good amount of money yeah, then. It was. A, I, I wanted yeah. nothing. In Corpus, in Corpus Christi, it was a lot. Oh, of that's money. banging. When we moved that's to Atlanta, money. we needed more. But we had then at that point he was well invested, so we yeah. had other income and pension. He was retired, and my mom made money, and it, it was good. But one hundred to one hundred fifty by the time he retired, which was we had a boat, we had a nice little yeah. boat, oh, wow. we had a house, wow. we had cars. You can go. Pay uh, went for to, a my week. brother went to private school, and then um, we had a scholarship. But then when I went to, yeah. We went to public, private. We there's nothing I, yeah. I wanted. There was never anything we couldn't afford. That's that all I, I want. Wow. Is I just want a little piece, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that we don't anything we need we can have, and yeah. anything you want we can get within reason. That isn't stupid. I mean, who needs a Lamborghini? I mean, I'm not saying I want to buy you that, but like having a little boat, it's yeah. fucking amazing. Like you we, said, we had you're, Camrys, Toyota Camrys, and. A, I think my brother got a Ford Explorer, which is a Just real nice car. Nice sure. middle of the road, oh, great. awesome, right. sick looking vehicle. The stuff we spent a lot of money on was like college and yeah. my private experience school. Yeah. and yeah 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 and yeah. that was investing and I, I just wanted to make six figures that was such my so my goal of like whatever I do I just want to be able to say I make a hundred thousand yes. dollars like my dad did that is a pretty small amount of money now dude I, I cannot to, raise oh, no. a family it's my, now it's two hundred thousand sixty thousand that's what when it was I, when I was in high school I was going into engineering school I was like yeah, wow, I make like sixty k yeah. oh I remember thinking yeah. you know when I, in two thousand I remember somebody going that's not a lot of money no but in 06 <laughs> when I moved out here Teachers I got a, that now. <laughs> I got a job for Forty five thousand dollars. You would think I, I fucking I was CEO of Walmart. Like I was spending. I had a credit card with like a five thousand dollar limit. Uh, I thought I was like yeah. what the guy. That? that was 06. Okay, that yeah. was what I was making in eleven. Oh, in eleven. Yeah, uh -huh. that, it's and it was uh, how I was living. I was paying maybe nine hundred dollars rent so a month. So was I. Nine hundred. And I. <laughs> God, I, I spent so little money. I just did comedy. I would, I would eat yeah. super cheap. I would yeah. not go out to deals. I was not dating. I did not go out drinking. I just did comedy. Mm -hmm. and I was saving a lot of money at that point. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, but once it's you impossible get a little bit, of, once you save a little bit, it, it whatever it does, it just kind of frees I've you never, up. A little bit. I've never been able. That's to what like I had when I got fired. Was a good. <laughs> you had cushion. Steak? See, I had a good, but and see, I ended up not cutting into it. I lost my job, and then within like two months, I was making working money enough college gigs. Oh, sick! I booked a shit oh, right out. Like two months after, I did this. Uh, I did NACA, and I booked like. 50 oh, gigs for the year because you were clean you, you, you were clean too but I was young oh, I could relate you had to them the I was 25 yeah. years old oh, my jokes resonated to those. and I that was how I made my living and I started working with MTV and I I did I had always had the money paid it was I was so really you did fortunate it smart but that's your fucking parents being great parents uh, at least like instilling you it's white privilege it's a lot of things but, it's but, a lot but, of luck but your see what when you said the thing about your mom it like shot me into dad mode and I was thinking what if my son told me he wants to do stand-up, I might have the same reaction as your mom because I've had to work my ass off to just maintain a little piece of stand-up that I have right now just to keep the bills paid. Your son's like, I want to do stand-up. Just be the funny guy at the office. <laughs> <laughs> just be the funniest be CEO guy. in the history the funny guy at the of office. finance. <laughs> Maybe you do like a little bracket pool. You get into the NCAA. Just, right? yeah, just you know. Seriously. <laughs> Don't fucking be yes. a stand-up guy. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll give you some jokes you take to the office. What about like an OnlyFans? You want to start Seriously, like an OnlyFans? Yeah, yeah. Great. You and your mom. Ten ninety nine income. <laughs> Me and your mom gave you great genetics. How about you start an OnlyFans? All right. <laughs> Bang a few broads, guys. Whatever you got to do to make your money, get your Stretch creative outlet. <laughs> Let them see all the way down there. <laughs> way better than stand-up. I'd rather be showing my asshole right now on OnlyFans than have to show up to Altoona to do an hour for five fuckers at a VFW. I'll to share make with my friends. Bucks. My son's got an OnlyFans. Fans in the, uh, in the yeah, and I have my shows. I'll hand him a card with your asshole. My buddy Matthew Sar gave me an idea. Put a picture of your asshole on it, and it just says comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I want that card so bad. It needs to go on the pin wall here in the break room. <laughs> oh, it's so good. So Another you were talking about is the point I love is is the pride of. I have to make all of my money doing comedy is such a rookie game. It's so du- I am and, a tonight. And the I see young comics like saying to me, saying on stage that they're a full time comedian. I'm like, how is that possible? Homeless. How are you gonna I know how homeless. I'm getting by with my numbers, yeah. and I don't see you doing the road unless you're doing college gigs. I I don't know what you're doing. You're lying to me or to yourself. And I would respect you more. When it, a formative moment for me was I was at the comedy store. I was new to L.A. I felt like a pariah. I didn't know yeah. anyone. I showed up there. Um, not a friendly environment. When Not a friendly you, environment. Not. when you And I, me at 25, I was not the kind of guy you would assume would be funny. Um, uh, I just looked like a wannabe actor just hanging out. And I mentioned on stage that I was a financial analyst in an otherwise lackluster set. And Eddie Pepitone comes up to me oh, and talks to Eddie. me for 20 minutes about finance. Oh, wow. If I had said I was a professional comedian, that guy would have, oh. he would have forgot me the he second I He saw you being stage. honest and yeah. that attracted yeah. him to you. And he was so interested in finance and how it worked. He didn't know one thing about it. He was like, what? how does that work? I'm like, oh, I'd love to explain it. It's my job, so yeah. let's, yeah, let's party. Awesome. And uh, I see a lot of people where if you talk about your day job, I'm more interested in you and helping you as a comic than you trying to lie about being a place you aren't yet. That's right. fascinating. Yeah. That's really interesting. I can totally agree with you. And it, there's a realness to it. Even comics have like <laughs> tequila companies they're starting to oh, try yeah. to make money it's, other ways. Dude, passive and supplemental income is so necessary in stand-up. And I think in this day and age with the way things cost mm-hmm. and everyone now having to have two hustles. I mean, yeah. There's a lot of people who don't like except Eddie McGowan. Do you got OnlyFans I don't know about? Bro, I mean, I'm going straight for the I'm going straight for the vodka. The fucking yep. G vodka. <laughs> yeah, wow. dude. Yeah, yeah, that's I what am, I'm doing. I'm going to uh fulfill my birthright of being a a, a real estate <laughs> person. <laughs> I mean, we really, really invested in some property this year. There's and, no, uh, there's no schedule. I like this a lot. I'm yeah. turning into that guy. I'm like, well, the Homestead Act. You can actually, if you claim residency, you pay lower tax. They cap the tax. I'm like, I hear myself talking. I'm like, oh, you're you're being that. Is you're, now you're the time that. to do that though, with the way housing prices are and they're higher than ever? Or if you, you can buy, if you can buy now, cash, holy shit! Then you what, can, a, okay. what a wonderful position to be yeah. in. But yeah, but it's, it's mostly that's what I mean. Like I, so we're looking to buy a house in two years, and we have some people near here. Like I'm talking, they're trying to buy a house now, and they had a fucking beautiful house they liked put money they're like hey let's do this get the deal signed let's go and someone just came in with all cash oh wow and just oh, okay. bounces you yeah and they that's it that's what honestly there's so many attractive well there's so how few that, buyers do you not what do you know how, how does that work because i thought the person who sells their house 
They get paid, right? By the bank. You get paid by the bank. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Right? But the so escrow the, the escrow shorter and when the cash is readily available, it's preferable. And nothing could go... I mean, there's just... I don't know why uh, a seller would prefer cash, except that the money's there and there's no worry about the... You, you, no paperwork, yep, no paying nope, for attorneys, yep. no paying for all the people that negotiate... It cuts negotiate out a ton of shit. Yeah, time. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's a done deal. Yeah, I would... If you were deal. selling, would you say, hey, we want to take this pile of money now or pay it off? Yeah. Or, well, you don't even get the... You get paid off flat. I assume you get paid off right away by the bank. The bank makes the money. But the you said years. it right. There's all this shit. A ton of shit can happen when it's a loan. A ton of shit. The yeah. the finance could get pulled. The right, all, they could lose. There their- is just a lot more. There's a lot less risk if you see the money in the account already and they can just pay you. Yeah, right. It just yeah. happened. Okay. It's just okay, they're more attractive. Sense. And this they also outbid. Oh, they paid. For and them. they outbid. Oh, they outbid. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. But even I think if it was yeah, even Steven, they would still cash, take the cash. I guess mm-hmm. you have that much cash. It's like, well, that's okay, the problem. what's going to take another Now you're getting grand. to a place where what, like 0.001% has that kind of cash. And anytime they want to scoop something on you, they can. And this person's not even going to fucking live in the house. It's a big enough plot where they're going to separate it. And they're going to make two houses so they can make double the money. And, yeah, and generate income immediately. Yeah. So they, but they're and weeding out the middle class by doing that. Whatever. We were doing that. We're, we're, we're looking to do something like that. We're like, well, what a great way to like make money if you can just, if you want to put away some now, you sure. immediately create income. And then yeah, I was like, what a good way. Why don't more people do this? I was like, oh, this is what BlackRock does. Yeah. BlackRock took this and scaled it up to, you know, billions or trillions. Yeah. See, like, you, oh, it's so evil. you doing that, like you and your wife doing that as an investment because you guys have jobs that don't have a foreseeable future you can really plan on like other jobs. She has a good job, but yeah. Well, I know. Yeah, yeah she does. But you know what I mean, though? It's uh-huh. like, I'm like, oh, cool. So if a person, you know, saved up enough money with their partner and they bought, okay, I would, I don't, I don't see a problem with that. But what you're saying, when a fucking huge company's doing it and just weeding out, yes, people like me who like make a great living, yeah, I just don't have act. I'm not you're liquid fucked. enough at eight hundred thousand to just we're, go. Here. We're all renting forever. That's yeah, how it's working. Yeah, that's the way it's be, trying to be. be so that's lucky. fucking brutal. This is turning into a financial advice <laughs> podcast. This is so funny. I was <laughs> mad money with. <laughs> um, I was dating a girl in Philly, and her family was very, very wealthy. And uh, she bought a house, and we were living together. And um, it had an extra apartment, and uh, she where like oh, it was generating Philly's revenue. Cheap. Yeah. And uh, I was like, uh, "Cool, so I'll be like the landlord." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be like Schneider. <laughs> I was like, "Yes, yeah. so I'll be like the landlord." She's like, "No, you do not talk to them." I'm like, "Yeah, but if they need something, and fixed. I love this, then, then your teeth. Well, if they're are all, all behind fun. on a payment, and they need a little." Uh, and what's uh, better, yeah. your teeth were all fucked I up. I had broken teeth, too. I <laughs> was like, yeah, but if they needed something, you know what I mean? I could be. You're not the like, face of the organization. Like, you're, you're more behind the scenes involved guy. involved in this in any way. <laughs> <laughs> you're not to talk to them. <laughs> what if I just uh, do this with a pipe <laughs> menacingly? Outside their window. <laughs> the first. Hey. It's the third. <laughs> What do you have going on right now? Like, what's what stuff that people can look out for? Are you oh, I just filmed a special. I'm awesome. on the road a bunch. Yeah, Check out my cities: Austin, DC, Toronto, blah blah blah. What are you uh, excited about? Anything, or it's all pretty much standard? Uh, just the special. Just getting that special out. It's like a lot of jokes I really like. Yeah, and that's, that's what I'm working on. Where'd you shoot it at? Uh, Littlefield, Brooklyn. Oh, yeah, that light board there is really pretty. Cool, cool man. Dude. How how uh, how how long until it comes out? Do you think May? If I if I get my fucking editing done is the cut my part of it are you you're not doing the editing right you know but i have to like say you have to go through it all that's what i mean yeah uh we had i think seven cameras oh we got in there real nice real pretty yeah Yeah, yeah, hell yeah now is the move uh i know netflix a lot of people would prefer a netflix deal obviously but i feel like with youtube or has that now been exasperated with youtube a lot of people if you have a big enough following could generate enough cash from that if you get a million views on it i, guess. I think uh, for me my thought isn't i don't need to monetize this in a ah, desperate way i okay. would just like as many people to see to it as see possible it. okay so because, that's the uh, two yeah. different pro- the two different thought processes i'm always late to these things the people who are truly successful in comedy are the ones who do things that no one else is seeing i haven't been that guy in the past i've never been the first one to an app or a platform but how it looks like right now the people with the really popular you uh, Netflix specials are the ones who had one already pop on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Schultz, Shane. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've had who one. else? Jared Freed. Like they they put out their own, and then Netflix yeah. is like because the model for Netflix has changed now. They're not looking to give you a following; they're looking to for take you to your bring following. One. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. That's all. That's so uh, funny. Right. That's Rife everywhere. Did a special. Then he did Netflix. Oh, Another yeah, example. Right. Ah, yeah. 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 Yep. Damn, that's fucking crazy. Now you like no one develops anyone anymore. 
But I have to say this though, I do like this is you th- remember back in like 2018 when all the specials had like a gimmick. Yeah. Remember, uh, was it Drew Michael did like a no audience? Oh yeah, yeah, you know I, know I remember I mean? that. Yeah. Gary Goldman did like a sketch in between with his mom. Like everything mm-hmm. was just like. It, now it's like you shoot it for YouTube, shoot it in a yeah, club. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward now, it's right? Like I, I, lo- I love. Now I miss that. Yeah, so it's kind of like I, I miss waffles. Danny Jollis and I complain all about this all the time. We're like. We should go back in time and just smack our, our past selves for complaining about Nanette. Because compared to the crowd work clips we have uh, now, uh, yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, God yeah, forbid yeah, someone yeah. have a through line and some heart pushing yeah, the narrative yeah. along uh, beyond just jokes. And now it's just 40 second joke, you're gay, applause, yeah. over. Yeah. I'm like, oh, we, we've let attention spans shrink so much. and uh, That now I, I nuance like, and artistry aren't even something that people have in their Rolodex. Going for something a little more. I, there's there's a balance, obviously, but it's it, it's another thing. Like the, yeah. Like the thing earlier that kind of waffles, right? Yeah, you yeah, want yeah, really yeah. short, really concise, uh, uh, immediate payoff, or something that is a bit more you soak in. Like Dune 2. Dune 2 was such a good movie because you had to actually pay attention. It wasn't just wham, bam, pow. Yeah. I think we're so tired of the the freneticism, if that's the a word, uh, of like Marvel stuff where mm-hmm. like Dune made you <sighs> take in this shot. Yeah. yeah. Just it's a painting on the screen. They're gonna let it's, we're gonna let it sit immersed. there for more than three seconds. Yep. Yeah, it's a, you got to be immersed in yeah. this to to get the art right. Yeah, so I wonder which way comedy is about to go. <sighs> Hopefully, it's about to stretch it stays back out alive. Again or, yeah, you know, I think it will. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone that uh, is human <laughs> would say that they wouldn't want to watch another human be able to in person for sure articulate something that they're going through in a way that they mm-hmm. can't. I mean, I think that will always be something. Yeah, but uh, I mean. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Uh, what are you gonna do, Ed? I'm just when the revolution put, comes. Just trying to put this hour together. <laughs> <laughs> just trying that, to get to the next spot, just, motherfucker. Just trying to get this fucking. Just That's a full time job. Like just doing do. an hour yeah. of comedy used to be a thing that you're like, "What are you doing?" You're like working on my hour, and people are like, "Wow, okay, yeah, good." Because you would now, spend three you, years you just on it. Me, like you just did a special. What else is going on? Yeah. Ah, what? You making you making <laughs> noises? You, you, you're building an app? What are you doing? You got a, a sketch show. You're gonna, You're gonna hit up that guy again for the financial like, analyst oh, gig. I, put my, I poured my life into these sixty minutes of I know, jokes, right? and you're like, but like you not enough years. <laughs> Dance. <laughs> Tell everybody where they can find you. I'm at Monday Punday on all platforms. Awesome. Uh, you can follow me at Josh Ricardo. Go to joshricardo.com for tour dates. The Working Class Holes tour, headlined by me, featuring the one and only Eddie McGee, starts in May. So make sure you start buying your tickets. Those links will be out in the beginning of April. Follow me on Ed McGowan, at Ed McGowan Comedy. Follow me. Uh, go to my website, edmcgowan.com. Email us at workingclasscomedians at gmail.com. Tell us all about your favorite comedians. What? Who's your mom's favorite comedian? Does she remember? It's <laughs> a great segment. <laughs> Gary <laughs> Goldman. <laughs> Goldman, right. The names are always wrong. Uh, all right. We'll see you guys again next week. See you. you can listen to us on all major podcast platforms every Wednesday. You can follow us on Instagram at Working Class Holes. Also, make sure you watch the full show on YouTube. All you got to do is type in Working Class Holes. And please don't forget to rate us five stars and tell a friend. Come on. 